Ben? Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, large-scale distributed systems. Again, things like uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, you name it. Um, and so one way in which these systems achieve this scale is they uh, replicate data across multiple nodes. So this can take several forms. Uh, they can store data in data centers located across the world. Uh, this is to tolerate disasters and also to minimize latency by allowing a user to access the closest data center. Uh, within every data center, the data is spread across thousands of machines uh, to balance the load and also for fault tolerance, because these machines fail all the time. Uh, and finally, users may have replicas on their mobile devices to support offline use. Now, ideally, programmers using such systems would like them to provide uh, what's called the strong consistency model, meaning that all this replication is transparent. Uh, the system behaves as if it processes requests serially on a single centralized database. Now, unfortunately, achieving strong consistency requires using synchronization. If a user issues a request at a replica, this replica will have to immediately contact other replicas to make sure that they're in sync. Uh, now, uh, this is, increases latency, uh, and uh, if network connections fail, then it also may uh, force us to make the system unavailable, which is the consequence of uh, so-called cap theorem. So because of this, uh, many large-scale systems nowadays uh, give up strong consistency and provide what's called the weaker consistency models. Now, one particularly extreme kind of a weak consistency model is uh, what's called eventual consistency. Uh, this gets rid of synchronization altogether. So if a user issues a request to a replica, say to deposit $100 into a bank account, then this request is going to be processed at this replica immediately and its effects are going to be propagated to other replicas only later in the background. So this weakens consistency. For example, uh, a user sitting at a different replica will see this deposit with a delay. Uh, but such anomalies are often okay for applications. For example, you know, that's how bank accounts are, operate in reality. So that said, some applications have more complex correctness requirements, and one particular kind of a requirement that I'm going to be talking about here is invariant about the integrity of the data that the databases manage. So these are statements of the kind, account balance is always non-negative, only registered students are enrolled into a course, uh, the winner of an auction is the highest bidder, things like that. Uh, and eventual consistency is often too weak to preserve these kinds of invariants. <coughs> Uh, so let me illustrate this using the example of the account balance. Uh, let's say we have uh, two replicas maintaining a copy of the account balance, initially 100, and we would like this balance to keep it non-negative, right? Now what can happen is two users can concurrently issue withdrawal requests asking to withdraw $100 each from the bank account. Under eventual consistency, these requests are going to be processed without synchronization, uh, at their replicas, so they will both succeed, the balance will go to zero, and then once the effects of one of the withdrawals get propagated to the replica of the other, the balance will go minus uh, 100, so the invariant is going to be violated. Now one way to repair this situation is to use strong consistency throughout the system so that the withdrawals are synchronized, but the trouble is that then deposits will have to use synchronization as well. And this is not really necessary in this case to preserve the integrity invariant. Uh, so this motivates giving the programmer the ability to choose different consistency levels for different operations. For example, to make withdrawals strongly consistent and deposits eventually consistent. And there are now quite a few databases, both commercial and research, that allow the programmer to do this. Uh, so choosing stronger consistency is not free. You pay for stronger semantics with a higher latency possible availability, and in fact money. For example, Amazon Web Services will actually charge you more for a strongly consistent access than for a weakly consistent one. Uh, and so given this, uh, the programmers would like to get away with the minimal level of consistency that is necessary to preserve correctness. But the problem is that it's hard to figure out because these systems are complex. And so our contribution in the paper is a proof rule and a tool that help programmers in this task they check that certain integrity invariants will be preserved under given choices of consistency for different operations. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. Now, our proof rule is developed for a generic uh, model allowing consistency choices. Uh, and this model is not implemented by any database in its full generality. Its point is that it can encode many existing models that are, in fact, implemented. 
Uh, so I will start by presenting this consistency model uh, fairly informally, <coughs> relying on operational intuitions. Uh, and you can find a declarative formal semantics in the paper. Now, first of all, uh, as the baseline level of consistency, our model will assume something, our, uh, something stronger than vanilla eventual consistency, uh, because uh, eventual consistency allows all kinds of anomalies. So, in fact, we're going to assume uh, causal consistency that Moxon talked about uh, in his talk. Uh, so, the particular kind of anomalies we want to disallow is this. Uh, let's say we have a case where a user first deposits $100 into a bank account and then makes a note, adds a notification saying that this has been done. Under vanilla eventual consistency, the messages about the effect of these operations can get delivered to other replicas out of order. So then a user connected at a different replica uh, may see the notification, but when he checks the balance of the bank account, the balance will be zero. So this is weird because uh, what's happening here is that the system doesn't preserve the causal dependency between the deposit and the notification. And so we'll assume that every operation in our model is guaranteed at least causal consistency. And this is the model that guarantees that causally dependent messages are always delivered in order. And this model can still be implemented without using synchronization. Now, another component of our, uh, of our consistency model definition is the semantics of these operations that I perform on the database, things like deposits and notifications. So to define this semantics, I'll assume that I have a set of replica states, sigma, and for every operation op, I'll assume given a function of op double bracket value that gives me the return value of our, this operation uh, given the state of the replica where this operation is originally executed. So this is uncontroversial. The trickiness here is that I also need to define how this operation changes the state of the replica. And this is very complicated in the system because I need to take into account not only how it changes the state of the original replica where it's executed, but also any replica it's propagated to. So to sort this out, I'll assume an, uh, another function. So for every operation op, I'll assume a function op double bracket effect that takes as a parameter the state of the replica where the operation is originally executed and then gives me another function describing the effect of this operation. And so this is the function that gets sent to other replicas in the system. And for each such replica, it will get applied to the state sigma prime of this replica to incorporate the effect of this operation. So let's see how it works in an example. Uh, in our bank account example, our, the state is just an integer. And if I have a function that queries the balance of the account, then uh, the, value, the value, double bracket value function will just return the state. That's as, as expected. And the effect function in this case was going to be an identity function because uh, querying the balance doesn't really change the state of the replica. Now, the more interesting effect is uh, for the deposit operation. Uh, in this case, uh, the effect of the deposit will be a function that takes the state sigma prime of any replica where this, this operation is, is propagated to and increments it by 100. So if at a replica I had, say, balance 50, then after receiving a message with the effect of this operation, I'm going to have 150. Now, there is a subtlety here in that not every such definition would actually do uh, as a definition of the effect of an operation. Uh, let's say we define the effect of a deposit in a bit of a different way. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the state sigma of the replica where a deposit is originally executed, add 100 to it, so that's the state sigma plus 100 of this replica after the deposit is executed, and then I'm going to take the state of any replica in the system, sigma prime, that receives a message about this operation, and just overwrite the state with this new balance, sigma plus 100. Uh, then I'm going to get into trouble. Let's say uh, I have initially a balance of zero at two replicas, and I'm concurrently depositing 50 and 100. So in the effect of these operations are these functions that just overwrite the state of, the, of a replica with 50 and 100. So initially, these messages are going to be propagated to the replicas itself. So I'm going to, as expected, I have 50 and 100 of these replicas. And then these messages are going to be exchanged between replicas. And so at that time, they will just overwrite the state of these replicas. So we'll end up with uh, 100 at one replica and 50 at the other. So this is an undesirable behavior because even after all the messages in the system have been exchanged, the replicas are still in a divergent state. 
Uh, so the crux of the problem here is that of the, uh, I'm applying the effect of these two deposit operations in different orders and different replicas, and these effects don't really commute, so I end up with different results. So to make sure that divergence doesn't happen, I'm going to require that the effects of operations uh, in my system have to commute. So I'm going to take these functions that op double bracket effect returns to me and impose these requirements on them. So if I have two operations, op1 and op2, <coughs> executed in state sigma1 and sigma2, uh, then their effects will have to commute. And this is not a very taxing restriction because in practice, uh, programmers can use so-called uh, replicated data types, uh, which provide ready-made commutative implementations of uh, certain kinds of operations. So with this restriction, let's now look at, go back to our bank account example and look at the semantics of the problematic withdrawal operation. Uh, so here is its effect definition. Uh, what happens here is I take the state sigma of the replica where withdrawal is originally executed, and I check that there is enough money in the account at that replica, so sigma is greater or equal to 100. If there isn't enough money, then the effect is the identity function, so I don't do anything. And if there is enough money, then the effect is a function that decrements <coughs> the state sigma prime of any replica where this message is propagated to by 100. So with this definition of an effect, I'm going to get into my previous trouble of the balance of the account going negative. So let's see how this happens. Uh, we have, we're in the previous situation where initially the balance is 100 at both replicas, and I concurrently issue two withdrawals of 100. So now the effect of these operations is going to be uh, this function that decrements sigma prime by 100, because there is enough money uh, in the, at these replicas. So the replicas, initially the balance will go to zero, then the message from one of the withdrawals is going to be propagated to the replica of the other. Uh, its function is going to be executed there, and then the balance will again go minus 100. So to make sure that this doesn't happen, I need to strengthen consistency for withdrawals, and this is how we're going to do it. So to strengthen consistency, uh, we have a mechanism which we call the token system. Uh, essentially, it's locks on steroids. So we assume that a programmer specifies a set of tokens, tel1, tel2, et cetera, and there's symmetric <coughs> conflict relation on these tokens. So by picking different instances of this token system, I'm going to pick different ways of controlling concurrency. I'm going to get different existing consistency models. For example, if I want to get a mutual exclusion lock, then I can uh, set up just one token called lock and say that this lock is going to conflict with itself, so no one can hold it at the same time. If I want to read or write a lock, uh, then uh, I have our two tokens, read and write, and I'm going to require that the writer token conflicts with any other token in the system. <clears throat> now, each operation in the system is going to acquire a our set of tokens, so I'm going to specify this using this op double bracket token function, and the guarantee that the tokens buy me is that operations acquiring conflicting tokens <coughs> cannot be unaware of each other. So if I have two operations, op1 and op2, acquiring conflicting tokens, tel1 and tel2, then it must be the case that one of these operations, let's say op2, must have received a message uh, with the effect of the other operation, op1, before it got executed. So we don't know which operation it's going to be, but one of these operations will have to be aware of the effect of the other. And to implement this in reality, we would have to use synchronization in implementations. So now coming back to our example, our here we would, to sort it out, I will use a, a single mutual exclusion token lock that conflicts with itself, and withdrawals will acquire this lock. So the first withdrawal to go in the system will actually succeed, and then the second withdrawal uh, will have to synchronize with other replicas to make sure that, uh, to check if there are other withdrawals acquiring conflicting locks that he might not be aware of. So yes, because in this case there is such a withdrawal, uh, its effect will have to be propagated to the second replica, after which the balance will go to zero, and then the second withdrawal will fail because there isn't enough money left in the account. And then deposits are going to acquire no tokens at all, and so they will proceed without synchronization. So now the verification problem that we want to solve is that given such an arrangement of uh, tokens, conflict relations, and the semantics of operations, we want to figure out if the invariant is actually going to be preserved. So the balance will always be positive. 
Now, the usual way you would go about proving this uh, is you would consider any point of execution uh, in the system. You would consider a state sigma of any replica. Let's say the state satisfies the invariant. And then you need to prove that the executing uh, operation and any operation of this replica will actually preserve uh, the invariant. Now, the issue in our case is that the process of execution is complicated. Again, it's not only that I execute an operation at the origin replica, I also have to propagate it to any other replica in the system. Now there, its effect is gonna be applied at the, in a different state, sigma prime, uh, from the state sigma where it was generated, so I need to prove that the effect of the operation preserves the invariant in the state sigma prime. Now in general, proving this is a tall order, if we don't know anything about the state sigma prime, so we have to somehow constrain sigma prime given uh, whatever information we know about sigma. And to achieve this, we'll steal some ideas from logics for shared memory concurrency. Uh, in particular, we use our, we'll use so-called relied guarantee reasoning. We'll make assumptions about how the states of other replicas in the system can change. More technically, uh, these assumptions are stated using so-called guarantee relations. So what happens here is uh, we are, we're gonna interpret acquiring a token as acquiring a permission to change states in a particular way. So this is gonna be specified using these relations. So for every token tau, I have a relation G of tau that describes the changes to the state of the database that are allowed if I acquire the token tau. And on the side, I'm also gonna have a relation G zero that describes this, the changes that I can do in, a, in any case. So in our bank account example, our, the token log is gonna be associated with the guarantee relation that allows me to decrease the balance. This is the dangerous operation that require acquiring the token. And, our, our, and, and G0 is gonna allow me to increase the balance or leave it unchanged. So now given this, here is the proof rule uh, that uh, allows me to prove that the invariant is preserved. So there are many symbols here, so let, let's try to make sense of them. So first of all, I need to find the guarantees as part of the proof, that's as expected. And then for every operation, I need to uh, check this assumption, uh, check this requirement. The uh, backbone here is as expected. Uh, I consider any state sigma of the origin replica, assume that it satisfies the invariant, and then prove that the applying the effect of the operation generated in sigma to any state sigma prime of a different replica will preserve the invariant. Now, in addition, there is an extra assumption that says that the effect of the operation on the state of this other replica, sigma prime, sigma prime, conforms to the guarantees. So if I look at how the operation changes the state of our, any destination replica, then this state change has to be allowed either by our, the guarantee G0, that describes the stuff I can always do, or by the guarantee uh, for the tokens that I acquire the stuff that I'm allowed to do given the tokens I acquire. Uh, in exchange for this extra obligation, I get to assume a certain correlation between the state sigma where the operation is generated originally and the state sigma prime of a different replica where it's applied. So in more detail, the state sigma prime may differ from the state sigma by the effect of any number of operations that are concurrently executed at this replica. Uh, so I have a transitive and reflexive closure of a relation describing the effect of these operations. And the relation itself says, well, either these operations can do uh, things that are always allowed, which is my guarantee G0, or they can do our state changes that are allowed by the guarantees for tokens that don't conflict with any of those that my operation acquires. That's what that bottom symbol says. So uh, it's kind of complicated, so let's look at an example. Uh, in our bank account example, the invariant says that our, <coughs> the balance is always non-negative, so sigma is greater or equal to zero. The guarantee for the token lock uh, allows me to decrease the balance, and the guarantee G0 allows me to increase the balance and leave it unchanged. And I have uh, my dangerous withdrawal of 100 operation. So I'm gonna focus on the obligation that just proves that the invariant is preserved. Uh, I get to assume a certain correlation between sigma and sigma prime, stated in terms of guarantees. So my withdrawal operation acquires the token tau. Uh, this means that the set of tokens that don't conflict with this token is empty, because lock conflicts with, uh, sorry, token lock, so lock conflicts with lock, which means that any other token in the system conflicts with my operations. And so the parameter to G is actually empty. 
Uh, then this whole expression degenerates to just G0, G0 prime. Uh, and this means that our sigma prime, the state of any replica in the system where the operation is applied, is going to be greater or equal to the state sigma than uh, where the operation is uh, originally generated. So the balance of the destination replica is going to be at least as high as the balance of the origin replica. Now, my invariant says that the balance of the origin replica is good, it's non-negative. And then the effect of the operation is going to be unpacked into some if statement describing under which conditions I, are, I can decrement the balance. Now, if you do a bit of a math, then in this case, you can actually check that uh, this obligation is going, to be preserved, is going to be true. And intuitively, uh, the reason is that our, if the, the, this condition, sigma prime greater than sigma, implies that if there was enough money at the origin replica, then there will be enough money at any destination replica where the operation is applied. Okay, so our, I'm running out of time, so our, let's just say we've proved this sound, and uh, we've also implemented it in a tool that uh, we applied to a number of applications. And I'll conclude with uh, just a brief statement positioning this work. So we've had lots and lots of work uh, doing something with uh, shared memory logics for concurrency. It started with the wiki in Greece, and it's still going on. You know, every popol in ESO or ESOP, we, uh, we have like papers with new program logics for shared memory. And we have almost none, almost close to none logics for distributed systems. So this looks like a pretty fruitful area to work in. And so what we've demonstrated is that some clean and modular reasoning principles that were originally proposed in shared memory still carry over to this field. And so this gives us a starting point for further developments in logics for distributed <coughs> systems. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, hi, I'm Raman Lavoy from University of Rochester. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, some operations uh, may need uh, locks. Um, is there something in your semantics that can capture which function, like for more complicated functions, need um, that conflict relation, and which functions, which operations? Sorry, I couldn't hear. May what? Sorry, operations uh, may. The locks. They. Uh, so, so you mentioned that, for example, withdraw needs. Uh, uh, locks right. to work on a lock, uh, but deposit doesn't. So, is there something in the, in your semantic can, which can uh, capture which operations need um, that the conflict relation? Well, so our basically the proof rule that we proposed, what it gives you is the ability to check that if you were, make certain choices as to which operations need to, which locks need to conflict with which locks of tokens, or which operations need which tokens, then the invariants are going to be preserved. Now, we think that it's possible to do automatic inference, uh, so given an invariant, figure, to figure out which locks are needed, or what the conflict relation should be, and we're working on this. Okay. Um, I forgot my other question. Thanks. Let's take more questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>